is uh, forensics, CNET 121, and we're up to lecture four. So let's talk about this stuff here. Um, so there is an American Society of uh, Crime Laboratory D Directors is an organization that provides standards and guidelines, and there's an international standard, an ISO IEC one. Can you just turn off the video? What's that? Can you just turn off the recording? I, say, I think I did. Yeah, I, wait, yeah, it's on. Yeah, yeah, good. I appreciate you checking, though, because I certainly could fail. Anyway, so, so you got the scientific working group on digital evidence, too. You know, and so these set standards, and people um, can meet them. And so there's been labs out there. There are private labs that will do computer forensic examination for you. I mentioned one of them is Drive Savers in Nevada around here, and there are a lot of others. So they could do e-discovery, where they're finding electronic data because you have been sued, uh, where a plaintiff accuses a company of doing something bad, and then a judge issues a discovery order, which tells them to produce all the data on this topic. Um, under Sabanus Oxley, all publicly traded companies must maintain all their data for a certain period of time, so that it's available in case they get sued. And um, it depends on the type of uh, document. And uh, so anyway, this is essentially the same as forensics. You have to dig through all your IT systems and find documents that meet certain criteria. So um, here's some issues. Uh, evidence acquisition is uh, just gathering evidence from a device, making a copy of the hard drive and the RAM and such. Uh, email is another place you have to go, and you may have to go to paper records if they actually only have stuff on paper. I don't know how many people do that anymore. Um, and there may be databases and web hosting, and these days, cloud services, extensive cloud services, probably my Office 365 and Dropbox and all that stuff is there. <coughs> and you can uh, access those by logging in with the company credentials, and you can actually if you get a court order and subpoena data directly from those services, which is what the police do. That's why a lot of people that will try to delete their local stuff probably don't realize if you have a business account at Dropbox, they keep 30 days of old files. So you can recover anything that was deleted in the last 30 days from the cloud storage, which is handy for the cops. So you have a laboratory of some site. It, you can be whatever you want, but this is typically what you'll have. You'll have a closet of equipment, a place to lock up the evidence. You have to have that. And then you'll have some workbenches to work on various computers and take them apart and such. Um, so you're trying to get read-only image files. Therefore, you have to have, um, your stuff has to be secured so nobody is messing with the computer. So logged in uh, with uh, password protection, of course. Multi-factor authentication would be better. Uh, you might purchase these FRED devices. These are um, predefined forensic workstations that are you know, built for you or you can just build your own. Um, and the main thing you need to have here is enough tools to get into the machines, and you always need write blockers. Write blockers are essential so that you can collect evidence from a storage device without writing anything to the storage device. It's uh, completely unprofessional not to have that. And so you might get the Celebrite Analyzer is one of the brand names that's very big here to get um, data from mobile devices, Oxygen and Blacklight are other ones. and. Uh, all right, there are others out here. Then you can have a field kit. Now, it's easiest if you work in your lab, of course, but often you have to go into the field and gather the evidence there because for one reason or another, you cannot remove the workstations from there. So you go into the field and all you do is collect the evidence and take it back for analysis. And this is often something you have a fairly junior person do, um, but uh, they have to know what they're doing. So they just go there with a bag containing a lot of big hard drives and a powerful computer to run some kind of forensic duplicating software on it. And you have Faraday bags for any wireless devices. You put them in a Faraday bag or a paint can works to any kind of metal box that keeps the radio out of it so it cannot receive a remote wipe signal or emails or IMs, any of which would change the data. Uh, one thing to know, though, is you connect an external battery because when you put a cell phone in a Faraday bag or a paint can, it turns the radio up to maximum power trying to reach the cell tower and drains the battery. So um, if you let the battery drain to zero, you might get locked out because when it boots up, it's going to require the pin or a uh, biometric authenticator. So what you do is connect it to an external uh, mouse, external uh, power supply. And also you have a mouse jiggler to keep computers from going to sleep because that would be the same problem. They go to sleep and then you might need the password to wake them up. Whereas if they're already logged in, then you bypass that. All right. And so you have to have some place uh, where you can lock things up in a safe some people use or some kind of locked room where you can go to court and testify. My lock was secure enough that I can testify in court that I am sure nobody got in there and meddled with this evidence. Um, all right. 
And so your cloning devices, these are disk duplicators. We just plug in a disk here and another disk here and it copies from one to the other. There's various options of them, SIM card readers. Um, the drives you use to take the evidence, by the way, one simple rule, you must always clean those drives first. You should have a drive that's completely zeroed out that you take in, then you put on the evidence. This is one of the top 10 rules of, of computer evidence collection that is surprisingly often omitted. Um, and toolkits, of course, to take apart all the devices to get at the storage units inside there. Uh, flashlights, digital cameras to record the layout of the scene where the cables are, the papers and everything. Uh, very important to have a record of what you found before you start taking things apart. And then there might be a question later of what you did. And of course, evidence bags. They don't have to be anything super fancy, just a bag that you closed in a way that's difficult to open. At DEF CON, there's a contest uh, doing, taming, uh, opening these without leaving traces. It's not like it's impossible. Uh, this, you can just take a syringe with acetone and dissolve the glue and open it, but it, it's difficult. So you just gives you reasonable confidence that nobody's been messing with it. And then the real evidence is you put it somewhere, you close your bag, you make sure nobody's messing with your bag. You're going to be the one in court testifying that the measures you took were sufficient, that you know nobody messed with it. So you'll have to make this to your comfort. But in fact, in practice, people use these or even paper bags. They just staple them shut. Just so that there's some reasonable likelihood that nobody messed with it. Um, let me check for comments over on the Twitch. Uh, yeah. Radio, yeah, radio go to maximum in the Friday bag. Yep, yep. That's, I only learned that in my French classes too. Will I be at DEF CON? Well, probably. I'm usually there. Um, haven't decided yet, but I'll decide pretty soon. Um, but I like, I'm pretty excited about going this year because they moved it to a convention center, which will be a whole lot more comfortable than wandering through five casinos getting lost, which is what I've been doing all these years. Um, I really don't have much interest in casinos. A convention center, I think, would shoot me better, but we'll see. Anyway, so you got to have software to uh, collect images. You can just use DD on a Mac, or you can use any of these commercial uh, tools. Um, and virtual machines are very useful. Um, you can boot up a copy of the evidence machine, so you can use the tools on there and such. Antivirus is useful, although this is a thing to be aware of. When you take images of an evidence machine, there might very well be malware on that machine, and you still want to get that data. It's just when you analyze it, this is why you do your analysis in a clean environment, uh, knowing that uh, the evidence could contaminate your machine. Um, and uh, password cracking software, uh, various Hack, various uh, forensic tools have this ability in hacking tools to try a bunch of passwords. One technique that often works is to just take every word on the hard drive, like a million words, and then just try those for the password, hoping they save their password in some file somewhere. That's one simple technique. Um, doesn't always work, but it often works. Uh, JPEG and other formats are out there. We talked about it before, GIF, PNG, Bitmap, and RAW. And some of them, JPEGs in particular, tend to have metadata, which will often have the date and time and physical location the thing was taken, the name of the owner of the software, very useful information to prove more than just a picture will prove by itself. Um, but often just the picture itself is all you need, the picture showing something happening, everybody can see what it is. All right, and here's one of the tools that can reconstruct photos if the fragments are located in non-contiguous sectors on a disk. There are only a few tools that can do that. In most cases, it's not worth it. For example, if you really care about photos, the main case, the main case you're worried about there is kiddie porn, where people are getting kiddie. And they don't have one kiddie porn picture. They have thousands of them. So if you only find two-thirds of them, that's good enough. It doesn't, you don't usually need to recover 100% of the photos. But if you do, then there are tools you can buy that will do a more perfect job of reconstructing the deleted photos from the fragments. Um, check for comments in the Twitch. Yeah, nothing new. All right. And uh, if I can figure out which tab I'm on, all right. So uh, it takes a lot of energy, of course, to run all those machines, and you should have an uninterruptible power supply. So if the power goes out, your machines don't just crash. Uh, you should have fire extinguishers, and you're going to have to spend a lot of money on all that equipment. So you know, your, your typical forensic examiner uh, on, in private practice, as they get a case, they keep getting more money and buying more stuff, and getting bigger case and buying more stuff. You know. Uh, so you got to restrict access to the lab. This is extremely important. You're going to have to go to court and testify that I analyzed this and nobody wandered in and altered the evidence. So you really have to have reasonable physical security. And uh, you have to limit who's able to get at the data. And I know the FBI has, um, they take evidence and they put it in the cloud. 
and then investigators log into a cloud system and analyze it with FBK. So the evidence is actually in the cloud, so of course I hope they have good two-factor authentication limitation to getting at the cloud because if someone was to breach their cloud storage of evidence, that would really be an embarrassment. Um, so, and if the other people can read it, that's an exposure of privacy. If other people actually go in and modify the evidence, that would really be bad. So uh, presumably they have good security on that and physical security, like I said, and you have auditing, either a, a surveillance camera or just a sign-in sheet so you know who's been going in the lab and who's been leaving, so if anything bad happens, you know who to blame for it. Um, all right, and of course, you include it in your disaster recovery plan. What are you gonna do if the building catches fire? What is your plan to preserve that evidence, um, if you can? All right, so extracting evidence from a device, you often do this with Linux, either Linux or Windows. Uh, you do need to know Linux to some extent because you're gonna run into it. And all the portable devices, all the IoT things are pretty much all running Linux because it's more efficient. Financial fraud is a big one. Boy, I used to work in finance and uh, that's why I, mean. I started prosecuting Donald Trump. I said, why don't they go after the financial crimes? Because you can prove those. All the rest of this stuff is like sort of secondary, like he said something at a rally, then the people invaded the Capitol. Is that really his fault or not? You can argue that, but the financial crimes are clear. But the thing I didn't appreciate at the time is financial crimes are not high crimes and misdemeanors. You could not prosecute him for those while he was president. You can't impeach him for that. But now that he's out, he is facing trial for the financial crimes and losing. Because, I mean, financial fraud is pretty simple. There are records, there's money, you know where it goes. It's uh, pretty easy to find the evidence, you know. And so anyway, um, so you, you find uh, credit card numbers, and uh, here's categories of credit card numbers, there's a numbering system, how it works. There's, uh, they talk here about a credit card, how a credit card number is formed, which I'm not too excited about, but there are certain ranges of these numbers for the different credit card companies. And then there's check fraud. There's also these customary numbers on checks. So uh, this is somewhat interesting, although I've never needed this information even though I was working in finance. I just take the numbers and accept them as they come. Skimmers are a big deal. And I was just talking about this on today's podcast. Not only are there skimmers that have been around for a long time where they can put an extra thing on top of the reader. So when you swipe your card, it makes an extra copy of the mag stripe and sends it to the bad guy either through short range radio or by storing it on a device they'll remove later and it has a camera to get your pin. However, now people don't do this. Now they use the chip, and they have new skimmers that seal the data from the chip. And they say they're almost impossible to detect. They'll be inside the reader. So uh, they say what you really should do is wave your card over. Or use, I, I use uh, Apple Pay wherever I can, and that's much safer. And there's no physical contact. And it's, uh, the one thing about Apple Pay that made me really happy to use it is it uses a separate number for every transaction. The old system with the mag stripe or the old uh, rubber carbon paper things, they copy your credit card number and they can just use it to do multiple transactions with that number. Everybody has the same number. It's like handing a stack of blank checks to everybody. It's amazing it works at all. And I talked to one of the guys that worked in fraud at the credit card companies and a few of them, and they, uh, Allison Miller came and gave a talk here. They actually hired her. She's a mathematician, an expert in game theory, and she, what they do, they, all the defense of that system was at the credit card company detecting suspicious transactions. And they just got very good at, here's two or three purchases at the same time, here's a purchase in another location where the person isn't, here's a purchase with a strange amount. They just got very good at detecting those. Since the system didn't protect you at all, they would just weed them out at that end with sophisticated tools. But the chip and pin is supposed to be better, and the magnetic, you know, radio frequency thing is even better. So, anyway, that's a thing to be aware of. Um, let's see. Yep. Okay. Nothing new in the comments. All right. Uh, so, you can also have point of sale system infected. This is what happened to Target. Target got hacked about eight or ten years ago, and. Um, the bad guys wandered through the network for months and then they installed custom malware on the point of sale systems that would steal the credit card numbers from RAM while you were swiping the cards in and then save them and then zip them up and encrypt them and sneak them out of the network. And they stole vast amounts of credit card numbers that way. That's the sort of thing. There can be malware on the payment system you're using. Um, and here's an example of an ATM with a false front with a tiny camera, these skimmer devices. I've always thought there's so many third-party ATMs that are old and garbage. So yes. It's not too easy to infect at this point. Yes. You in fact, there, there was another article last week from a guy that hacked into a Bluetooth, uh, into a Bitcoin terminal, which just looked like one of those. And it turns out it was incredibly awful. All you have to do is reboot it. And when it reboots, it opens a terminal command line briefly. 
and you can use that to get open a shell. Then you can't type, but it reads a QR code. So you can put in data with a QR code. It'll execute it as a command. <laughs> then he gets in. He found that they all had a, he found the master password table. He found a hard-coded root password that was easily cracked. It was the same on every one of them, and, and you're in. And whenever I see those little cheap gas station things, mm -hmm. I don't want to use them. I said, man, that, that doesn't look good. <laughs> I like using the one at the bank. Or Apple Pay. Apple Pay is a lot better. Yeah. Apple Pay, I understand what's going on. Apple Pay, your credit card number is stored in the secure element, which is a separate trusted platform module like device in there that can't be stolen by any malware. And when you pay, it makes a different number for every transaction that cannot be reused. So it's a whole lot safer. Anyway. And I imagine the Google Pay is probably safe too. I think it's pretty much the same, but it will depend on the quality of your phone. Some of the phones do not have a secure element. They have a simulated one, which in fact has weaknesses. Um, so it would depend on how good your Android phone is. Would that be over the cloud, which is why it's... Uh, no, um, it, it's, what it would be is it would be stored on the device in a supposedly secure area by the processor that in fact is not really secure and there are ways okay. to sneak in. Whereas in the Apple, it's actually a separate chip. It's like a TV. You're like essentially the same as a TPM, and there is no known way to steal that with software. The only people know, the only way people have been able to steal that is by dissolving it with acid, using an electron microscope, and reaching in and probing it. The, Joe Grant managed to do that once, but I mean, as far as you know, even if you get malware on it, they're not going to be able to get your credit card information, as far as we know. All right. Anyway. Um, all right, and then there's um, steganography, which is the process of uh, hiding a message inside another message you do not even know you're sending a message. This is a covert channel. Now there's encryption, like we use like HTTPS over the internet, where you can send your password to Google and nobody can read it but Google, but anybody can see that you are sending some data to Google. So if you were going to like a game and your company has a policy against games, HTTPS would not save you because they could still see where you were going and what time you went. So you haven't concealed the communication, you just concealed the contents. But steganography conceals the whole thing. You take some, this is what terrorists have used to, tell, to, to signal attacks. <coughs> They'll have some system like go to find the 10th black cat on, on some page of photos, and in that image is your, your instructions. And so other people don't know any messages in there at all, but if you use the right software, you find a hidden message in that file. That's steganography, hiding a message inside another file. Typically, you hide a text message inside an image by changing the colors just slightly, and then you have some pattern, and you can just make up anything you want. Every 50th pixel, you take the lowest two bits or something, uh, and there's an infinite number of such systems. So in principle, it's very hard to detect. In practice, people use standard commercial programs, and therefore, you can just try the standard commercial programs <laughs> finders. Um, Anna Chapman did this. I don't know if she remembers. Anna Chapman was a Russian spy that came to um, Washington and started seducing generals and people and finding their secrets and sending it to Russia. They got, they caught her and she managed to flee back to Russia, but she left her laptop behind. They went on her laptop and found her steganography software. Um, and uh, then, um, then after, a couple of years later, Snowden fled to Russia and she offered to marry Snowden as sort of a joke because she's a popular like glamour underwear model in Russia. And um, she's also a national hero in Russia. She's a spy that Tax American, why you Washington? And so uh, that's what Snowden's lawyer said. My, like, my advice to you is marry Anna Chapman and never come back. I don't want to try defending you. If you come back here, you're toast. So, and he stayed there, and apparently he's doing all right in Russia. Yeah. So, and maybe Turtle Carson will stay there too. I wouldn't cry about that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, all right. Anyway, uh, so that's what steganography is, and there are some steganalysis tools to find these if you use standard steganography techniques. So, uh, let's try a Kahoot. Let me just check for comments first. No new ones? All right, let's find a Kahoot, which is this one. All right.
code. I've heard this about QR codes. You can put another sticker on it. Yeah. Uh, not good. That's the right thing to do. That's yeah, a shame. That's why right. QR codes are, are questionable wisdom. Yeah. yeah. to be suspicious of everything. That's good for you. you know, that's how that's how all the scams work. They trick you into you know, good for you. you know, this, is, this is the right attitude. Yeah, Cory Doctorow just wrote about how he got scammed and it, he got scammed a couple times. It's very interesting, but both times it's because he's kind of off balance, he's rushing, he missed his flight. That's when they get you. You know, when you have time to like be careful, then you don't do it. But when you're in a hurry and then then you say, "Oh, well, I don't have time to worry about this. I'll just Yeah. Well, that's what you do. In fact, I've seen uh, scams where they have partners in one guy to create a scene to get people upset and then the other guy tricks them. Yeah. Yep. yep. Move you into an emotional state where you're not being careful. We're all vulnerable. So, which U.S. law requires companies to preserve their information? So, in a softly, I think that came about because of Enron. Enron had their accounting firm was destroying the evidence right before the lawsuit hit. And they said, you know, that should be illegal. <laughs> yeah. All right, the hardware device that only law enforcement can get. I saw this go by, I didn't mention it though. defeat the past pin on iPhones, although I wonder, I think I only heard about this maybe five or ten years ago when it was four-digit pins. Now that it seems to be six-digit pins a lot, I wonder if it would still work, but anyway, it tries all the pins in some way. I think what it does, it can defeat the ten guesses by some trick like rebooting the phone every nine times or something, mm -hmm. so it can break into a phone by brute force eventually, but um, it may be out of date or maybe they have a new version of it. Anyway. Celebrite is a device that can break, they claim they can break into anything. Which one do you need to have for your forensic lab? These are specific brands of technology and you could buy a different one or build your own, but you have to have a write blocker, whatever you're doing, so you can correctly gather evidence from a device without altering it. You do not necessarily need to have these exact brands of tools, but you need to have some similar tool that can accomplish the same thing. All right, what Linux tool extracts evidence from a device? <laughs> Oh, that's DD. 
just duplicate. Makes an exact copy of any drive. Thank you.